Good morning. Today is September 20th, 2017. My name is Judith Jenkins, a volunteer with the Hanford branch of the Kings County Library Veterans History Project. Would you please state your full name? Craig Lewis Gardner. Thank you. Well, welcome aboard, Mr. Gardner. We're so happy that you have time to come and interview with us today. I'm going to ask you a few questions about your, your, um, your background and your military, specifically your military um, career. But I'd like to start with, uh, where are you from? Well, before I joined the service, my, my father was uh, in the Air Force mm -hmm. for uh, 23 years. So we traveled all over the world. Uh, but uh, basically California, uh, I started elementary school down in Southern California, ended up in Northern California, up in Napa Valley, uh, where I finished most of high school. Okay. Um, are your parents still with us? My mom is deceased okay. uh, yeah, while I was at boot camp, and my father just passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. What did they do for a living? What was their occupation? Well, again, my dad was in the, in the Air Force. So okay. he, uh, cryptology. Okay. Uh, and then when he got out, he was uh, working with the fire department, uh, mainly in Florida, okay. as a communications and so forth. And of course, my mom uh, was a uh, homemaker. Uh, and uh, I don't recall her working. Well, that's good. Yeah, I that's guess good. so. Have more time with... Uh, the family. So do you have, speaking of family, do you have any siblings? What are their ages? Yes, I have uh, two sisters. Uh, one's uh, a year older than I am, mm -hmm. and the other one's a couple of years younger than I am, mm -hmm. and a brother that's uh, first on board, and he's uh, 64. So two of them are in Florida, and one's in uh, California. Did, did any of them serve in the armed forces besides yourself? My brother served in the Air Force Reserve. Okay. What did you do before uh, you uh, joined the military? What did I do? Uh, whatever I wanted to do. Oh. I was uh, pretty rebellious as a young, young man. Uh, the 60s uh, were in full blossom, I guess, and uh, uh, I just did whatever I wanted to do. Uh, as far as work-wise, I wasn't uh, employed, uh, but I, uh, I uh, left home at an early age, uh, at 15, and made my rounds around the country, hitchhiking around, uh, and enjoying the uh, late 60s, early 70s. You sound like you had a very uh, flexible and uh, diversified youth there, getting going here and there and traveling. I was un uncontrollable. You uncontrollable. I see. Okay, I got that. Um, what branch of service did you did you serve in? Again, could you expand on that? The army. The army. Okay. Were you drafted or enlisted or reserves? No, I enlisted. I I uh, think knew I knew from way back when I was a young individual that uh, I was going to join the military. I did not like school and uh, I was probably a D student. Uh, I, so I knew that I was going to, at the first opportunity, I was going to go ahead and join. Hence, uh, three or four days after I turned 17, I dropped out of high school and uh, joined the military. I wanted to go to Vietnam. Ah, so what year was that? 73. 1973, okay. Fortunately for, uh, for me, um, I did not know that uh, they had stopped sending troops, mm -hmm. I think in January of 73, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the war was still going on. You saw it every night on TV, mm -hmm. and um, I just knew I wanted to be part of the action. Okay, so uh, what inspired you to pick the Army? as your choice of uh, military branch to join? Well, I think at the time, I, I knew that, uh, again, I did not like school. And um, 
as most young men, we want to go out and and uh, get involved in the uh, the actions. Yes. Uh, that's why you see in the movies they don't uh, make movies about a uh, a cook or a typist mm -hmm. in the military. Uh, he's always some sort of warrior, uh, for the most part, for most movies. And uh, I think as a young man, that's uh, what I wanted to to experience. So, <clears throat> excuse me, going into the Army, um, you actually went through boot camp as part of your training, correct? Correct. Can you give us a little bit of background on that? How you felt about the training and the experience as a young man? Well, I, th I think that uh, a kid in my position, uh, we're easily uh, controlled. I needed that structure and I needed that discipline, even though I probably didn't realize it. But I wanted to be a part of that, so it wasn't hard for me to adapt to the to the military life or the military training in, in boot camp. Uh, I do remember, uh, you know, back in those days, uh, they the drill sergeants had no problems putting their hands on you. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first day getting off of uh, the bus and into the sand pit. And we were all at attention. And of course, some knucklehead wants to look around because that's the way civilians are. And so, the next thing you know, we we're all in the push up position. And the drill sergeant had came over and he stepped on the guy's hand uh, next to my hand. And there was probably uh, two feet between us, maybe three. And he told him to get up uh, with a few. Uh, few choice words and of course the, the guy next to me said well I can't drill sergeant and he said why can't you and he said because you're standing on my hand and so the next drill sergeant came over and stood on his other hand and the first one got off and he said and if, with a few choice words you know go ahead and get up now he says I can't and I saw his leg go by my head as he kicked this guy and the ribs, and uh, as I understand it, uh, he got carted off to the hospital and uh, a couple of fractured ribs. The, the, the thing I, I got from that is, you know, a brand new 17-year-old kid introduced in the military was that there was no such thing as I can't. You can do whatever it is that you want to do. And I was already formulating plans in my mind of how I was going to dig my hand out from underneath his boot if he stood on my hand. A lot of people look at it now and say, oh my gosh, how cruel is that? But I look at it and I think, wow, what a lesson that was for a young punk as I was. The lesson it got on, uh, I, I achieved from that. So uh, unfortunately for the guy, you know, he's, his ribs are going to be hurt for a while, but uh, it's a good lesson for me. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your military life and, and how you adjusted to it coming in at such a young age back then. Well, again, I was very impressionable. Uh, I remember my first duty station, of course, after basic and AIT. I, I did them both in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, I got sent to Germany, and uh, I, I remember the first night there, uh, a, there was eight of us in one room back then, and uh, I made my bed, and I you had your locker there, and there was nobody else there. I came in after duty hours, mm -hmm. and uh, was just assigned that room. And later on that evening, you know, uh, one of the guys uh, come back. Uh, from party, and uh, he just took the trash can and took a leak in the trash can. And I remember thinking, what the heck is this? Uh, and then another guy came in and opened up the windows and stood on the heater and just took a leak right out the window. We were on the second floor. And I remember thinking then that uh, what is what is wrong with this, these people? So it was a it was a really uh, 
emotional experience for a, for a young kid mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, in my first, in that first unit there, and at that time in the army, there was a lot of uh, drugs, a lot of uh, hash over in uh, in uh, Germany, uh, a lot of other different types of uh, pills and so forth. Uh, heroin was uh, predominant. Uh, racism was uh, predominant. Uh, most little gangs were. Uh, affiliated in the military, or at least in, them, in my unit. Uh, whites hung with whites, blacks with blacks, uh, Puerto Ricans with Puerto Ricans, and uh, even so much so on the, uh, into, the, into the civilian world out there, um, downtown, you had the, the black bar, the white bar, and the Puerto Rican bar, and so forth. And so you knew that uh, what bar not to go into. This is Otherwise, you're, yeah, this is Germany. Okay. Otherwise, you're gonna end up in a fight. And uh, so that was pretty impressionable, and, and at the, you know, because growing up in Napa, the uh, I came from, in that area, uh, the states that was a pretty much all white town, and the only thing that was uh, an influence up there was the KKK, mm -hmm. uh, the Hell's Angels were up there as well, but. Um, so that was the only thing I was really kind of exposed to that I really remember a lot of. And so like coming in the military and all of a sudden coming across all this uh, different groups and uh, was really uh, unusual and it was hard, I don't know, it was hard for me to, to, to understand, but um, uh, to accept, I think was probably a better word for it. Um, and the drugs, uh, it was really easy to you know, follow. Mm -hmm. you follower, so I just got I got involved in a lot of uh, uh, drugs and so forth in my early years in the military, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, very very uh, unusual time in, in the military. Guys coming back from Vietnam, uh, suddenly you know being reassigned to our units, and I you know met them and. Uh, and I remember thinking at 17 that uh, how in the hell did they make it through Vietnam? You know, this is this. They didn't. They didn't uh, uh, strike me as uh, the warrior type that uh, mm -hmm. would have thought you needed to be in, in combat. Mm -hmm. And I remember chalking up to just that. Uh, well, they were just lucky. Uh, and listening to their stories and so forth, uh, I realized a lot of them were just. Uh, just very, very lucky to have uh, to have made it. At least is my ideal about the war, which you'd have to endure, because uh, I didn't think they had a whole lot of respect for these guys. Right. And so, uh, like I said, most of the unit that I remember uh, was all into some sort of drugs or something. So that was a uh, uh, that wasn't hard for me to get along with because I was doing drugs before I came in the military. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, not the hard drugs, not the heroin. I never did the heroin, uh, but the LSD and some of the other stuff, uh, not a problem. And guys were doing that, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. To include my squad leader, the guy, my supervisor, uh, it was it was nothing for him to, uh, you know, say, hey, let's go blow a bowl. Right. And so this was the kind of leadership that uh, I, I had, and uh, uh, later on. I look back on it and think, wow, uh, we were a pretty terrible army back then, mm. in my opinion. Okay. Well, <clears throat> moving on, I wanted to ask you some questions, and I apologize, I have a little bit of a sore throat here. Um, during the wartime, did you uh, deploy during the start or uh, of the of operations? Did they send your unit directly out? Yes. After your training? Yes. Initial training? What was your assignment? Well, you know, from day one when I joined the military, I, I was a uh, 11 Bravo infantryman uh, down the ground. I spent uh, my entire 20 years uh, was uh, in the trenches, so to speak. Okay. That's all I did. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of guys in the military, as a years progressed, they would go on and become a drill sergeant they go on recruiting duty or they get some sort of staff job mm -hmm. and I never had that. I, uh, my only really break uh, as 
was I went and worked as a training NCO for uh, about 10 months. So out of 20 years of, uh, of working, uh, I was in the trenches. So every time I went to a combat uh, area of operation, I was either a, uh, a squad leader or a platoon sergeant. So I either had uh, 10 men under me or I had 30 men under me. And eventually, uh, as a first sergeant, uh, in the Desert Storm, I had 190 men. Okay, all right. Um, tell me a little something about your military friendships during this time. Did you stay in contact with uh, friends and family, and how so? Like sporadically or frequently? Well, during, in the military, I, uh, I was a very, uh, very, very devoted soldier. As it turned, as it came around, uh, got out of the drug scene, turned myself around, and um, uh, went nothing but up. And so, I was totally focused on doing my job. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, my uh, my relationships with uh, uh, my family suffered uh, significantly, and. Uh, You know, the friends that I had, I didn't have any civilian friends. All my friends were the military friends, and they were only at the unit level. Okay. And to this day, I only uh, stay in contact with one, uh, surprising enough. I found that uh, over the 20 years, you become, uh, at least I've become more isolated uh, away from uh, people. Um, and so I don't have any civilian friends to this day. I don't. Uh, I don't have any civilian friends. Mm -hmm. And I've got the one, uh, one guy that I've uh, known since the uh, mid 80s that uh, we stay in contact. Uh, I go to uh, some reunions and uh, that's where I feel most, most comfortable at. So mm -hmm. civilians, uh, the mentality is, is not the same. And uh, they, have not, they have not experienced what you've experienced. They'll have no idea of uh, what it's like unless maybe you're a first responder. Uh, I'm sure they have a pretty good idea, but for the most part, uh, most civilians uh, uh, I could talk to, but uh, I don't form a, a form a relationship with them. And so that was the same in the military. I didn't form a relationship with uh, civilians. Okay, we see that you brought your uh, shadow box here with some of your <clears throat> awards and medals. Could you uh, give us a little bit of information of what's what you have there? We'd well, like this is. This is more of my cheat sheets. I remember where I was located at okay. over the uh, over the uh, the years. These are just diff different uh, divisions um, that I that I belong to uh, that I was a part of, and uh, you know I had some great times in a in a, in a lot of these uh, these different types of units. Uh, you know, again, when I look back on uh, you know my career as overall getting involved in the drug scene and so forth. Uh, I remember I was up for my last Article 15, I think it was my fourth at the time, and I was gonna be busted now, uh, except the commander wanted to uh, uh, court-martial me. And so here I was at 18 years old, I think I was 18, maybe 18 and a half, might have been 19, and he wanted to, uh, he said, hey, we're not going to court-martial, or uh, Article 15 you, we want to court-martial you. And I knew I was dead to rights. Every time I got busted, I always went in there and they said, how do you plead? I said, guilty, you know, because I did, as a young man, still accept responsibility for my actions. Mm -hmm. But that, that turned me around, that, that incident right there. And uh, we were going through a test at that particular time called the Expert Infantryman's Badge. And uh, a series of tests that you would take to uh, show that, uh, that you knew your job. And I knew my job. I was. I just knew it. I couldn't help it. And so every every station I was passing. So at the end of this uh, thing, I was the number one uh, soldier out of our entire battalion uh, who earned that expert infantryman's badge. And the last thought, the last thing that he had to do was a 12 mile road march. Well, I was in pretty good shape, and I ran it. And uh, when I finished the division commanders there. So now we have this two-star general there congratulating me and saying, what have you done this for PFC Marne, Private First Class Marne. That was our nickname division, was the Marne Division. And 
so I could see this commander was having a problem now. How is he going to go ahead and court-martial a guy who's been congratulated by a, a division commander on, uh, on, on this thing? So eventually, uh, the commander called me in and said, you remember that, Article 15? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, here it is. And I tore it up. And that's what turned me, that point turned me around, 180 degrees. I went from being a, a mediocre soldier, knew, knew his job, my drugs and so forth, and I, I went nothing but up. Hence from there, I ended up in the Second Ranger Battalion. I ended up uh, volunteering for that uh, on the Ranger School, uh, uh, working with some uh, highly dedicated and professional men at that time. And eventually, uh, going through uh, 7th Infantry Division uh, Light, uh, uh, my nickname, if you will, was, uh, was harder than woodpecker lips. So, uh, you know, I, I was very, very uh, focused as a, uh, as, a, as a sergeant. And I made sure my men were trained and trained very, very well. And then eventually ended up in 1st Ranger Battalion uh, as, a, as a first sergeant. There's only 13 of these positions at the time, but first sergeants in the Ranger Battalion, the Ranger Regiment. So to be called by Ranger Branch and, and, and asked if I wanted to uh, try out for this position, that was an honor. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many men uh, who started as a little druggie, as a private, uh, could end up as a first sergeant in uh, one of the most elite units that the Army has? And so I, I look back on that and I think, yeah, 180 degrees all started when I, when I was being busted back there in 1974. <clears throat> Another question I have here is, uh, when you finished your uh, duty tour, you served a duty tour, did you continue your education? And if you did, was it supported with the GI Bill? Wow. You know, when I got out of the military, I uh, took 10 months and became a paint maker. I went from here as a first sergeant in the Ranger Battalion down to here making $5.35 an hour. And after about uh, 10 months of that, I said, you gotta be kidding me, you know? After going to combat three times and, uh, you know, realizing my full potential, I became a junior ROTC instructor. I ended up teaching uh, ROTC for the next uh, 23 years. And uh, in it, uh, I took on the, uh, an officer position. And the military came down and said, in order, in order to be a, in the officer position, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. I said, wonderful. Uh, the VA uh, paid for all my classes uh, because I am a disabled combat veteran. And uh, I was able to achieve my uh, bachelor's degree. Excellent. Excellent. However, I would have never achieved it had it not been for the VA. Because like I said earlier, they do not like school. Yes, yes, many of us don't. Um, so in reflections on uh, your military history, do you have, and you say you have uh, one or two friends, I think you said one, do you attend any reunions or uh, military ceremonies that your particular squadron had like to keep contact or in that way? The Rangers uh, have a reunion uh, get together once a month in uh, some pro uh, prominent cities in, in, here in America. I'm trying to find out if they have one here in Fresno. Uh -huh. When I was living in Phoenix, uh, I, I would attend that one uh, monthly. We'd get together. Uh, it was all Rangers or guys that were uh, very affiliated with the Ranger Battalions. And uh, we just have breakfast and so forth. And, uh, Great individuals, great individuals, from uh, Superior Court Judge uh, down to uh, uh, guys that were just uh, coming out of the military and uh, going to school at ASU, uh, firemen, uh, went from a Ranger Battalion into a fireman or policeman, and so that was a great time for us to get together. So uh, that, was, that was the only time I ever I've gotten involved in an assistant to Phoenix. Uh, when I first got out in 93, I, uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with uh, any military at all, other than my one friend. Um, by attending these uh, military
military functions or groups per se, did that help you with your transition from having a military career in life to being a civilian as you are now? No. I uh, didn't uh, attend those things until much, much later, until I'd already been out uh, in the military for, uh, oh gosh, uh, 18 years. Uh, I never realized that, uh, uh, that uh, I had a hard time adjusting to the uh, civilian world, if you will, until uh, I met uh, another individual that uh, showed me that uh, I could use some help uh, from the uh, VA, and I said, okay, well, let's, let's try that. So that was a good 15 years after I was out of the military already. Okay, well, future generations um, will see this interview. What would you like them to know about the military service and the experiences? It's changed so much since uh, I went into from guys and gals before me, everything changes. Your equipment changes, the uh, attitudes of America has changed significantly versus, you know, when I went in, Vietnam veterans, you know, we were looked on as, you know, we weren't looked on very favorably, it seemed. Now, uh, in this day and age, uh, their, their military is thought of pretty highly uh, mm -hmm. because, of the, because of the wars. Uh, I think it's an, uh, an honorable profession. I think that you can get outstanding training, mm -hmm. uh, top of the line equipment. Uh, men and women that I've talked to uh, that are in currently, uh, I'm extremely impressed with them. I, I remember a World War II vet said, you know, these guys are going over to Iraq right now, back when the, the war first started. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were really concerned. I said, uh, don't be, they'll come up, uh, they'll rise to the occasion. Out of uh, 300 plus million people that we have in the United States, there are always going to be um, plenty of soldiers, uh, men and women, uh, that uh, uh, will rise to the occasion and will protect America and its uh, way of life. Um, that pool, I think, will always be there out of that many people. It's always appreciative from businesses and so forth that uh, show their appreciation towards uh, the veterans and what they've sacrificed yes. uh, over the years. Um, I, I think it's a, a great way to start off in life uh, for, for young people. I, I, I think it's a great way you know, besides the training, uh, the people that you can get involved with, the friendships that you can make, yes. um, especially for a young person that doesn't have a, uh, anywhere to go. When I, after I first got out, I hope we still have time, after we, when we first, when I first, when I started in the JROTC, uh, I saw the educational system here in America, and I'm not too impressed with it. Um, and, you know, the, the kids that I taught, I, you know, try to find out, you know, what, what are they going to do in the future? And a whole lot of them had no idea what they're going to do in the future. Right. Some, and I emphasize some, uh, are going to do well in college. And they're going to, they're on their way. Uh, a lot have no idea what they're going to do. And if they can get into the military, uh, regardless of what branch, uh, you know, for the training and for the experience, for the maturity, get some money in their pocket, yes. uh, do their, do their uh, job for America, if you will, their time for America, and then, yes. uh, and then get out. Uh, th those formal years of, of, 17, 18, 19, 20 are very formal. We're, yes. we're, and what a great place to have um, good leadership over you, helping you guide you in, in, in the ways of, uh, of life, if you will. And then get out and, uh, and go on with life. And I think that for those individuals, uh, young people, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. Uh, for those that can make it into college and so forth, great. Uh, every educator out there seems to think that all kids are, are uh, going to go to college, and they're not. And, and I, I wish the educators of America would wake up uh, and uh, go back to the days where we had uh, yes. uh, automotive class and woodworking yes. and electric shop and so yes. forth and, and teach these kids a trade, um, but they don't. And all they do is they expect them to go to college, and it's not going to happen, I'm sorry. I agree. A whole lot of them are not going to end up in college. 
And what are they going to do? They're going to end up struggling. Well, what a great way. Get in the military. Get some good training. Have that leadership. Uh, the guys able to take care of me when I was a young guy, a uh, young soldier, as a young leader. You know, if you get some, get some good leadership over you, you're going to do well in your life. Okay, well, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry again. Mr. Gardner, we thank you so very much for taking uh, the time for this interview today. And above all, we want to thank you for your service in the Army to this country. And we enjoy talking with you and you sharing your information as well as your experience of your, your military service to the U.S. Thank you. My pleasure. But one other question I would like to ask you. What is, um, what is the that any particular branch of the service um, that you know about, aside from your serving in the Army, on this day and age, what's happening with what's happening in the world, do you think, which is, which is the easiest way to get into a branch of service now for young people? Well, they, some of their attitudes is like, like you said, they're not quite formulated. I mean, you know, again, I, I taught 23 years. I saw how uh, young people are, and I saw their, their plans and, and uh, their attitudes. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, it's, it's, it's gotten progressively worse yes. over, the, over these years, and it's so frustrating and disappointing. And uh, I remember used to fight to try to get a kid to turn in a 300-word essay. Exactly. You go to college, you're going to end up, you know, nine pages Correct. essay right and so when they when they can't do stuff like that it's really frustrating uh, the the ASVAB score is what's going to make or break them exactly. in, into there right. and, and to join the military uh, the Navy and the Air Force uh, you know are 51 in order to get in mm -hmm. uh, the Army uh, a few months back they dropped it down to as low as 21 Generally, they were a 31. Uh, even the Marines hovered around the 51 mark. Right. Um, I don't think there's any really, any branch of services is better than the other. I think regardless of which one you go into, you're going to get some top of the line training. Exactly. And I think things that are 10 times more accepting than when I went in, whether we're talking about uh, the racial divide when I went in, or, or anything like that. Uh, now they have the transgender, uh, the homosexuals, uh, and so forth, and the military, regardless of what branch, is, is a lot more accepting of that. Um, are we still on camera? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I won't mention that then. <laughs> uh, that part. Feel free to speak on anything that you want, yeah. that you would like. Uh, so the military, I think, is, is, is a lot more accepting of things that were not acceptable in, when I came in, uh, when you came in, uh, every generation, right. you know, when they come in. We always look back and we say, gosh, you know, I can't believe they, you know, back in my day, we didn't do that, you know. Right. Well, it's, exactly. it changes. And I, I personally think, in, in per, and professionally, because I, I, you know, I have to stay in, in contact with the military doing the job as an ROTC instructor. So I was constantly either with recruiters or uh, veterans uh, that have gotten out, uh, or the reunions or whatnot, and talking to them about it. And uh, those those things, uh, those issues are uh, not um, an obstacle, right. if you will. And so any branch of service that a young person can get into, I think, is uh, they're going to get uh, some really good training. I agree. Uh, top of the line training. And mm -hmm. I emphasize that, emphasize, emphasize that to, to my students. You know, if, if you know you're not going to go to college, you know, I mean, if you're having a, if you're getting C's in high school, mm -hmm. you're not ready for college. <laughs> I'm sorry. Exactly. 
You know, you might, I remember taking a class over here at uh, uh, COS. It was at West Hills. Anyway, and so here I am, uh, 45, I think I was at the time, maybe a little bit older than that. I might have been 50. And first day of this English class, and uh, the young girl, obviously, you know, 18, uh, didn't have any, uh, the book that you're supposed to have, didn't have paper, you know, a pen. And, 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 you know, she wasn't prepared. That military side of me wanted to jump up and say, you know, what the heck are you doing here? You don't care about it. Get out. You don't care about yourself. And so this is, you know, a, a lot of the attitudes came from the high school, uh, the things that we're not preparing them uh, well for, for college life, if we're trying to get them into college life. The ones that uh, are, are plan on going to college, they are preparing themselves. And there's the key word, yes. themselves. Yes. They don't need that external motivation in order to do that. Um, and that's sad. Yes. You know, that's sad that uh, the, you know, 75%, 80% of the other kids, um, uh, they need that motivation. And we keep lowering our standards yes. in, in school, in my opinion. And I, I wish someday, you know, America would wake up mm -hmm. and say, we got to do something about this. Uh, you know, with, we're not competitive uh, to other nations around the world. Uh, even though we have the, the best equipment, the best uh, trainers, if you will. Yeah. But we're, uh, we're perpetuating a, uh, an entitlement type of mentality. Uh, I had to lower my standards in, in school. Uh, my, my first RLTC position, I, I required them to do a communication exercise. And I said, okay, you need to have uh, two world assignments, uh, two uh, national, two state, two local, uh, today's weather, tomorrow's weather, and a sports article. And when I was teaching in Florida, uh, I had a lot of Jamaicans and uh, Bahamians and Colombians and so forth. And uh, the ones that stood out were the Jamaicans. And I, and I had to sit back and think about that. Why were the Jamaicans doing so well? Why were they able to accomplish the assignment? Sat down with a couple of Jamaican kids, started talking about their life back in Jamaica. And they said, hey, if you get hit at school by the teacher, don't let your parents find out about it because they're going to beat you at home. So their standards uh, were what I interpret as the way we used to be, maybe back in the 50s and maybe in the 40s and back you know, in those days, the way I imagine it was. And ever since my generation, unfortunately, um, you know, the 60s, the late 60s, if you will, I think we either opened up this world of freedom to our to America, or or we shut down a lot of these values that we lost or that we've lost uh, you know, home life and so forth. Um, it's just a, it's a myriad of, of reasons why, but um, that'd be my advice to to the young people is you know do what you can to get in the military. Right. Uh, if you know you have no direction, uh, you're not going into your family business. Get into the military. Do three or four years. People appreciate the heck out of you. They find out you're a veteran. They're gonna, they're going to uh, think automatically that you have responsibility. You've got some leadership. You got discipline. You've got stick to itiveness, and uh, and that helps out in any kind of job. I used to tell my kids, "Hey, wear your uniform when you go to a job interview. I guarantee you'll get the job." Mm -hmm. And every one of them did got the job. Okay. Yeah, it was it was you know many old jobs, but uh, they still got the job. Because I know, I know what, and you know what, yes. when the, you know, an employer, a kid walks in there and he's wearing a uniform and you got, the other day I was driving down 198 and these, these two guys were uh, going to the court of all places. And uh, they, didn't, they weren't smart enough to tighten the lug nuts on their spare tire that they just changed. 
And so I, I saw the wheel wobbling and one lug nut come off and I'm like, I got up next to him and I said, pull over, you know, pull. About that time, the other lug nut went off, mm -hmm. the last lug nut. Mm -hmm. So the wheel was, and they pulled over just in time. It was just barely hanging on. And the kid said, yeah, I just changed a spare tire and I guess I didn't tighten him, tighten him enough. You know, this sort of mentality, you know, uh, to, you can't change a tire. Uh, well, the kid, the other kid was going to court for a DUI, and how was he dressed? I mean, he looked like a bum. And I, and I said, uh, let me give you some words of advice. You know, when you, you go to court, you need to dress up. You need to shave, you need to look him in the eye, and you say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And cross your fingers that, uh, you know, they're going to at least be lenient on you because you know you're guilty as hell. Well, that mentality is not in there in our young people. Accept the responsibility for their actions, just as every time I got busted. Hey, how do you plead? Guilty. Right. 30 days extra duty, 30 days restriction, two thirds of your pay, and reduced to an E1. Thank you very much, sir. You know, and I took it. At, at 17, 18 years old, I, you know, I might have been a punk, but I, I look back on it, I think at least I was able to accept responsibility for my actions. Yes. Young people today are not. Right. You know, when I had to tooth and nail to get a 300 word essay or to get them to turn in an assignment or something it was just I would just shake my head and think wow what, what are we doing to our young people here mm -hmm. and again I had to cut my standards in half right. so when I left Florida I'm teaching the Columbians and I ended up going to California Nevada and then Phoenix I ended up just cutting it down okay one news article you know and and, and it still have problems we're trying to meet that, that requirement. So our educational system, I think, is part of the problem, too. Mm -hmm. We're not holding up to standards. Right. Um, the school I was in in, uh, in Phoenix, uh, I saw, I, when I went to Bakersfield, taught down there, mm -hmm. I noticed no kids had their phones on. Mm -hmm. And I made a comment. I said, how come they you know, I haven't seen any phones. Oh, they're not allowed to have them. Good idea. Mm -hmm got over to Phoenix, kids all have their phones out. And the principal will allow them to have their phone on in between classes. Mm -hmm. Well, kids don't understand that before you, before, before you walk into the classroom, you take it out. Mm -hmm. you no, know, they'll take it out. They'll take it out when they get into the classroom or just before the bell rings or sometimes the bell would ring and they'd still have it in. Mm -hmm. And so, they're young people, they're going to, you give them your hand, they're going to take your arm. You give them your arm, they're going to take your shoulder, you know. And let's understand that. Let's draw the line and, uh, well, you know, you were in the military. You know, don't cross that line. Mm -hmm. If you cross that line, be prepared to accept the, you know, accept exactly. the consequence of your actions. Exactly. And so we just keep doing things like that in our education, and I think that's where a lot of our problems in our society uh, come from right there. Now, don't get me wrong, parents are 60%, maybe 70% uh, responsible, mm -hmm. uh, but the damage has already been done. Mm -hmm. We've already raised these generations of these uh, of kids, uh, to include my own, mm -hmm. that uh, have lost uh, those values and they, I've, got, I've got twin daughters, and one has done well, and the other one is a statistics of society. Mm -hmm. She's sucking the life out of the state, mm -hmm. you know, of uh, entitlements and so forth, and having children and so forth, and this one over here is working, her husband's working, they got a beautiful house, and so on, you know, and it's like, well, uh, so her kids are now having children, at uh, 15, mm -hmm. and so now I'm a great grandfather, twice over. You know why? Well, it's because of the values that parents are putting in there. Well, it's, it goes back and it keeps going back. Not only from you know the parents not instilling the right values, but our educational system mm -hmm. not uh, enforcing uh, good rules, if you will, and good values on on campus. Mm -hmm. So, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs>
I think you've said it all. I think you said it all, and um, you said it uh, in a very good uh, way because I think that's what actually is happening out here, and whether uh, people want to own up to the fact of parents or guardians, what have you, uh, as to what's going on, the fact that it is is right in front of your nose. And um, if there's not something done, as you mentioned before, it's not something done with um, what I call baseline the parents first, you're going to have more and more situations where uh, our uh, following generations are not going to be able to take care of themselves or be able to leave the country correctly. I was just watching that hurricane thing here this morning, you know, hit Puerto Rico. And I remember somebody telling me that Puerto Rico has got the highest welfare rate uh, in, in uh, the United States. Mm. And I remember that fact from somewhere, but I wanted to look it up uh, on the computer and, and put it in there. Why? Why are, why are we doing this? You know, my mom went on welfare uh, in 60, Eight, I think it was, and I remember then her pulling us off to the side of those kids and saying, "I'll get us off of welfare. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll get us off. Okay, don't worry about it." It was embarrassing mm -hmm. to be on welfare, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that's the mentality I kind of grew up with. You, when I left the when I left home at 15, I didn't ask for help from the parents. Mm -hmm. You know that was it. I was on my own. And uh, I never did go back to my parents and ask for money or anything else from that point on. You know, because you are a man, you better take care of yourself. Um, I've seen other people that are uh, a friend of mine, a civilian friend of mine, who is a, uh, I remember coming back on leave and I called him and I said, hey Steve, let's, let's get together. I said, where are you at? He says, what? I'm at home. Where's home? Well, you know, on, on Long Oak. You live with your parents? He's 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I said, you got to be a kid. I mean, I, I pretty much chewed him out. Mm -hmm. You're 30 years old and you're living with your parents? Mm -hmm. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. You have no business living with your parents at 30 years old. None. Zero. Unless you're a worthless individual, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, well, we all go through it. You know, maybe they're going through some hard times or something else like that. But I don't think that's the case. I think most cases that are just lazy individuals. And I see this other individual, 35 years old, uh, living at home. Uh, you don't do that. In my world, in, in uh, the generation that I grew up in, you didn't do that. Uh, you took care of yourself. And we've lost that completely. Now, People have no, have no problems with stay at home. And unfortunately, moms are more than happy to have their children stay at home forever, it seems like. You know, some of the, some of the mothers that I've, I've talked to and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of like, you know, appalled at that. But I don't think it's gonna get any better. I think the, the ball is already rolling. I don't think they're gonna be able to stop the ball. It's not, it's, they can't go back into school and say, okay, stop what we're doing, we need to revert. But that ain't gonna happen. It's not going to happen. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And you know, in 20 years, when I'm when I'm gone, uh, thank God, because I don't want I don't want to see what's going to happen with you know the future here. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. The technology, the jobs, the uh, intelligence level that you have to have is 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 great. You know, you can you can really do well for yourself. Mm -hmm. But we're really separating. I think. You know, the haves and the have-nots. Yes. And the have-not pile is getting bigger. Yes. And I remember reading about uh, there's more people, or there's less people working now, and uh, how are they going to be able to afford the Social Security because there's more people going on Social Security. The ones that were worked their life are on Social Security, and they got these young people that don't want to work and put into the system so that we can have our Social Security checks. So it's really, You're right. it's disappointing. It, uh, it really is. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, I, I wasn't a good kid. Uh, you know, I did what I wanted to do and got involved in, you know, too many bad things. But click, the light went on at 18 or 19. 
and said, duh, you know, come on, get your stuff together here. <laughs> That's what it took. It took some commander to look at me and say, we're going to court martial you and put you in jail. Yes. I was a good looking kid. I, I, don't, I wouldn't do well in jail. Okay, so uh, thank God it got turned around at the time. But you and I kind of have an understanding, I think, of the same mentality with uh, young people and so forth. And uh, to me, it's scary. To me, it, it, it truly is. And so it's really refreshing when I meet somebody out there, a young person out there that's really got their stuff together. I'm like, whew, thank God, well, there's one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with you. Unfortunately, I worked in pretty much inner city schools. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to see the you know, top of the line. I mean, in Phoenix, you get the you know, top down there. Mm -hmm. uh, you had 15, I think it was, high schools. And on the, uh, on the opening day, or not opening day, when all new teachers are there, and, you know, they were giving us all the statistics about the kids and so forth, and they said, 88% of your kids are Hispanic. And let me make sure I got this right. 5% are African American, mm -hmm. and 3% uh, were Native Americans, and then and there's others. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, uh, I hand went up, because, mm -hmm. you know, I just do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And I said, I look around here and I see a whole lot of white teachers. Mm -hmm. I say, where are all the white kids going to school at if they're not going to Phoenix? What does that tell you about the Phoenix Union School District? Mm -hmm. All the white kids are going to all, all these other Chandler and Mesa and they're going to these, you know, schools where their kids have a better chance, if you will, of doing, doing better. Mm -hmm. And so that was really kind of, you know, you know eye-opening right there, you know, to see that uh, we, we got problems in our educational system, you know. If the white individuals think that they need to take their, their kids and put them in private schools or charter schools or another school district that's got higher standards, and my guy, my co-worker was a major, great individual, because mm -hmm. um, he was prior enlisted. Mm -hmm. um, all three of his kids go to a charter school. And he told me, he says, in the very first day when they went in there, parents had better show up this meeting, mm -hmm. right? So they got all these parents in, this, in the auditorium and the principal gets up there and one of the first things he said was, I don't expect my teachers to have to tell your male students that they need a haircut. Bang, there's the standard. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, I don't know what kind of, what was considered a haircut, you know, mm -hmm. but, but there's a standard. I mean, and if you don't like it, take your kid and go to public school. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Failing grade was a D and below. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you got a D uh, or in danger of getting a D for the semester and you didn't bring it up, you're gone. I mean, what's that? that st and so the kids out of there, or majority of them, I think it was like 90 something percent, mm -hmm. went on to college. Mm -hmm. Because of standards. Exactly. Duh, America, why don't we get that? Mm -hmm. We need to raise the standards, mm -hmm. you know, in, the, in, in our schools, in our home. Yes. I took a kid home one day after this uh, camp that we had. It was for summer camp. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, me and my wife were driving home. And I said, so, God, what's his name? Start with a J. Jason. I said, so what, uh, what are you going to do with the summer? He says, well, I want to get a job. And I said, well, wanted to. It sounds like you're not going to get it. He says, well, my mom says I can't get one because then they'll take away that portion in their welfare check. And I was like, you're kidding me. Parent, you have an excellent opportunity here for your son to get some responsibility. He wants to do this job, you know, he's going to, and you're going to take that away from him because you're going to get the same amount of money, if you will, you know, and at the end of the summer when he's, he's got to go back to school, then you reapply and get your full welfare check. Well, that's, you know, what we're enabling people. Uh, people get content with their, in my opinion, I'm yes. wrong. People get content with their, their standard of living. 
okay, I'm happy right here. I got enough to pay my bills. Uh, and so don't rock that boat. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's my welfare check coming in or, you know, or whatever else, like it irritates me when I look at Subway or saying EBT cards, you know, accepted mm -hmm. here. You know, it shouldn't be that way. You know, if you get, you should have things for a block of cheese and bread and milk and, eh, you know, just the, you know, the, the stuff and not be able to, you know, use that money uh, for other, other things. A friend, a friend, a guy I knew, uh, I worked in the paint factory, I think I mentioned that earlier. He uh, uh, was a Vietnam vet, a guy named Rose. And, uh, you know, we always talk about what we're going to do. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. I can't, I can't work for five hours and 35 cents an hour. Man, this is crazy. I said, so I'm going to try and get a you know, school position down there in Miami. He says, he was making $8 an hour. He says, well, he says, I can't, I can't afford to do that. I can't afford to step down in order to move up. Because the money he made right there was enough to pay his bills and so forth. And so he... I'm scared to step down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get a step back, you know, take it, you know, suck it up, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pay your dues in order even to move up in a different profession. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to do. You got to do it. Mm -hmm. But he was afraid to do that. And I think a lot of people in America are afraid to do that. And that's, that's, that's sad. Real sad. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you so much. Force gun. <laughs> <laughs>